My name is Jaspreet Johal. I am a Clinical Anatomy Research Fellow here at the Seattle Science Foundation, as well as a recent MD graduate from St. George's University. And today I'm going to be discussing a topic called hemivertebrae. So hemivertebrae is actually a, a developmental disorder of the retrieval column. And the best way to describe it is that it exists as a wedge between the different parts of the retrieval column. So it can occur in the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, or the lumbar spine. It's most commonly in the thoracolumbar spine. It is classified as a defect of retrieval formation, and its etiology does lie in the embryology or development of the retrieval column. Uh, depending on its presence, its location, and the type and the way it's associated with the surrounding retrieval bodies, it can disrupt the natural curvature of the spine, and it actually is believed to be one of the most common causes of congenital or developmental scoliosis of the spine. There's different types of hemivertebrae, but the best classification system that I came across and that has the highest impact on clinical relevance is based on its location and relationship to its surrounding retrieval uh, columns. But the one that's most clinically relevant is defined as lateral hemivertebrae, and it uh, results from complete failure of formation of a segment on one side of the column. So basically what you're left with is uh, you have a laterally located wedge of bone that's made of half of a retrieval body, a single pedicle, and a hemilamina, and it's better shown in the images. So uh, here on the right side, it's a little bit difficult to see, but you can see a piece of uh, vertebrae right there. That actually is supposed to be one of the retrieval bodies that has failed to develop properly. So you have a properly located disc here, properly located disc here, and then this one just failed to form. Uh, and this image here on the left actually shows the, uh, the degree of damage that it can inflict upon the curvature of the spine. So this individual on the left actually has three hemivertebrae along the left side of the spine. There are hemivertebrae at T10, L2, and L3. And as you can see, there is quite a significant impact on the natural curvature of the spine. So the more hemivertebrae that you have present, the greater degree of clinical damage and the more important that you need uh, surgical intervention to correct the curvature. And you can also have uh, hemivertebrae on opposite sides of the uh, retrieval column. So this individual has a right-sided hemivertebrae at T6 and a left-sided hemivertebrae at T9. Some people have posited that when you have a uh, hemivertebrae located at opposite sides of the retrieval column, they actually end up balancing each other out, canceling each other's effects out, and they actually might not have as significant of an impact on the curvature of the spine. So for instance, this person has three hemivertebrae on, each, on the same side of the retrieval column. This person has a hemivertebrae on opposing sides. So that might account for difference in uh, clinical significance. And just to go back here, uh, like I said, if they're not uh, operated on right away, they can develop into congenital kyphosis or scoliosis. So now I'm going to get a little bit into the uh, development and etiology of hemivertebrae. And before we discuss the abnormal, it's always a good idea to review a little bit of the normal. So the key takeaway from this point, as I de described the embryology, is that during any step of the uh, developmental sequence of the retrieval column and the retrieval bodies, hemivertebrae can occur at any aberration or misstep during this sequence. So the retrieval column normally develops from uh, six separate chondrification centers that will appear by the sixth week of life. And as I said, one, one of the uh, causes of hemivertebrae may simply be failure of these chondrification centers to form properly. If these chondrification centers do form properly, then at each retrieval body, you will have a pair of primary uh, ossification centers with uh, each, with one being located dorsally and the other being located ventrally. So you have one uh, primary ossification center for each level of the retrieval column. These ossification centers will then come together to form a centrum. And this centrum develops into three separate loci that are also present at each level. These loci are usually visible by the 13th week of gestation. And as they go on to develop, one of the loci will form the future retrieval body, and the remainder of the two loci will contribute to each half of the retrieval arch. So again, you can see it's a very complex uh, developmental sequence when you're trying to form the eventual retrieval column, and any mistake along this step can lead to the development of hemivertebrae. There were some other uh, non-traditional or novel etiologies suggested for uh, hemivertebrae that I came across during a review of the literature, but most people seem to agree that it is a developmental disorder. One theory that I came across suggested it might be due to a lack of uh, blood supply to the retrieval columns. They said it might be due to improper formation of the intersegmental arteries, but I think it seems very accepted that it is a developmental disorder. This is just another image of a child with MRI, uh, with a child with a left lumbar hemivertebra. So the 
the location can vary. You can have thoracic ones, you can have cervical ones, or you can have lumbar hemivertebrae. So I mentioned earlier the classification scheme for hemivertebrae. There are a few different types of uh, classifications, but the one that's most relevant uh, clinically is based on their growth pattern. And what I mean by growth pattern is uh, specifically their relationship to surrounding uh, vertebrae. So the best way to describe it is through an image. So the one on the left here is referred to as fully segmented. It's separated from its surrounding vertebrae by a nucleus pulposus or a cartilage as a normal retrieval disc is supposed to be. The one, on, the one immediate to the, to the left of it is referred to as semi-segmented. It's semi-segmented because it has a normal, uh, retrie a normal nuclear disc above it, but it is directly attached to the vertebrae right below it. And then the third type is on the right here, non-segmented. That hemivertebrae has no space around it, and it's connected to its surrounding vertebrae uh, on both sides. So the difference in clinical significance from each of these three types, well, you also have the one in the middle is incarcerated or wedge hemivertebra. This one's a little different than the other three. This vertebra is supposed to be a little bit smaller in size than the other three, and it's not as clinically relevant. So the fully segmented, as I mentioned earlier, it's not connected to its adjacent vertebrae. That means it has less of an influence on the overall curvature of the spine. So if we go back to this slide, the fully segmented ones, they're not connected at all to the surrounding vertebrae. Going down to the non-segmented ones, it's connected on both sides. The greater degree of connection you have between a hemivertebra and its surrounding vertebrae, you have a greater influence of that hemivertebrae on the uh, spine's natural curvature. So because this one's connected to vertebrae on both sides, it's most prone to result in scoliosis because it will have a greater influence on the curvature of the spine as it grows and expands. Whereas the fully segmented one, it has the least clinical relevance because it won't have as much of an influence on the spine's curvature as the individual grows. And that's just uh, what I mentioned earlier. So as the individual continues to grow and the spine continues to expand in size, you have a greater degree of curvature. And uh, the, uh, the other types, and growth and expansion of other types is restricted by uh, limited space, reducing their clinical impact. So uh, the incidence of this disease has been reported as one to 10 per uh, every 10,000 live births. And there does seem to be some sort of uh, increased incidence in male infants, although some other studies have uh, denied this association. And it is often found to occur in association with other developmental disorders. So you, amongst the most common are cardiac, renal, cranial, and other uh, skeletal anomalies. And uh, hemivertebrae may also occur as a part of some of the more uh, de well-defined uh, developmental disorders. You have batter bacterial syndromes, and it can also occur alongside Klippel-Feil and Jarko levin syndromes. And this is just another image showing uh, both the incidence of a hemivertebrae at the arrow as well as a sacral agenesis. Uh, so on the right side, this person is missing a sacrum. So that just goes to show that hemivertebrae might not always be a, uh, a lone-standing uh, developmental anomaly. And when you're working up a diagnosis of hemivertebrae, so it may not be visible on physical exam, and it's most often diagnosed during a prenatal ultrasound. And uh, when it, when an individual, when a, I guess an OBGYN, does come across the presence of a uh, hemivertebrae, you should do a thorough exam to make sure that there are no associated developmental or anatomical anomalies. So uh, in terms of uh, clinical management, uh, termination of pregnancy should only be considered for a hemivertebrae at multiple retrieval levels, and there is some sort of debate as to when is the appropriate time to employ conservative management and when you need uh, surgical intervention right away. Most practitioners, if there's only one or two hemivertebrae, they ought to uh, manage the, uh, the degree of scoliosis progressively, and if the scoliosis progresses too fast, then they will intervene surgically, whereas others will opt to intervene if there's uh, three or four hemivertebrae. They will resect them right away. Uh, the surgical options available for management, there's two approaches that have been defined in the literature. There is a posterior approach for resection and an anterior posterior approach. Uh, there's conflicting evidence in terms of which one's associated with more complications. The posterior approach is believed to be more technically complicated, but it does allow for greater operative advantages, visualization and all that good stuff. And uh, hemivertebrae in the lower thoracic and thoracolumbar regions, those are most likely to progress to congenital scoliosis. So those are the ones that warrant the most uh, obvious need for clinical intervention, for surgical intervention. And that's just uh, going over uh, the, the uh, debate that I described earlier between which surgical approach is uh, best.
it definitely is an area for further study, and I, that's one of the recommendations of the paper that I uh, completed on this subject. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention.